are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, award-winning Lighthouse volunteer and ACE proofreader. Hi, Cindy. (laughs) Thank you. Hi, Jeremy. This is episode 134 of Lighthearted, slated for August 29th, 2021. In a few minutes, we'll be talking with two guests from the Block Island Southeast Lighthouse Foundation in Rhode Island. Uh, we're actually recording this on August 20th, but you know, Labor Day is going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. Summer's winding down. How has your summer been, City? Well, I'm not a big fan of the heat and uh, especially the humidity. So I'm actually really looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the fall. But in the meantime, we're having a small wedding ceremony at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse tomorrow, which is August 21st. So um, I'm definitely looking forward to that. I will actually be there with two other Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse's uh, volunteers. Mm -hmm. So um, our podcast co-host, Michelle Jewell Shaw, Mm -hmm. and a very dedicated podcast listener, Bob (laughs) Zimmon. Uh, So the three of us will be in Newcastle, New Hampshire tomorrow over at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse uh, holding a little wedding. So definitely looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there this evening. This is mm. Friday, Friday evening, and we've been giving these small tours by reservation. Uh, that's all we've been doing this season. It's going really nicely. We're doing a couple tours on Friday evening and a few on Sundays, and it was just so beautiful there tonight. It's just, uh, I think it's the best time to be there in the early evening. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And speaking of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse also, I want to tell our listeners about a new book that we've just finished. Yeah. It's called, yeah, it's called The Light at Fort Point. Fort Point is what the uh, local people call that lighthouse. The Light at Fort Point is a special uh, 250th anniversary edition of the history of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, uh, which again is right here on the New Hampshire seacoast, about 15 minutes from my home here. I want to thank uh, you, Cindy, for all your help with the book, including your proofreading and excellent design suggestions. Oh, well, thank you. I'm really excited that the book is out now and just grateful to be part of it. It is available through the Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse's website at PortsmouthHarborLighthouse.org, and people can also get it on Amazon. So we uh, invite everybody to check that out. Mm -hmm. So, Cindy, has anything interesting happened on this date in lighthouse history? Yes, as a matter of fact. So Cape Otway Lighthouse, the oldest surviving lighthouse on mainland Australia, was first lighted on August 29th, 1848. The light in the 91-foot-tall sandstone tower serves to guide mariners through the Bass Strait between Australia and Tasmania. Today, the former keeper's cottages at Cape Otway offer overnight accommodations for the public. Yeah, we'll be featuring Cape Otway on this podcast in just a few weeks. It's one of the great lighthouses in the world, I'd say. Uh, Also, on August 29th, 1947, the American scientist and animal behaviorist Temple Grandin was born in Boston. She once said, quote, autism is an important part of who I am, and I wouldn't want to change it because I like the way I think, unquote. Cindy, can you help me tell everyone about Block Island Southeast Lighthouse and today's guests? Absolutely. Block Island, south of the Rhode Island coast and east of the entrance to Long Island Sound, lies in the middle of east-west and north-south shipping lanes. A lighthouse was established at the island's northernmost point in 1829, but it did nothing to aid vessels heading past the south side of the island. Wrecks along the south coast of the island were common. One of the better known ones was the Anne and Hope, which ran ashore in January 1806 with the loss of three crewmen and much cargo. Congress appropriated $75,000 for a first-order light and fog signal in 1872, and 10 acres of land at the top of the high Mohegan Bluffs were purchased for the station. A brick dwelling and attached 67-foot-tall brick tower were designed. The architecture of the lighthouse has been classified as the high Victorian Gothic style with Italianate influences. The building is an architectural showcase that's totally unlike any other lighthouse ever built in the New England region. It was also a technological showcase and was regarded as one of the best equipped stations on the coast, with a huge first-order Fresnel lens from France. The light went into operation on February 1st, 1875. 
Block Island Southeast Light Station was one of the last in the country to be automated and de-staffed. In December 1989, the navigational light was relocated to a steel skeleton tower. At that time, the lighthouse building was severely endangered by erosion of the bluff. In May 1991, the Southeast Lighthouse Foundation received title to the lighthouse property from the Coast Guard. With the help of Rhode Island Senator John Chafee, funding was secured for a move of the lighthouse to safer ground. The move took place in 1993. A first order Fresnel lens that had been in storage was installed and the lighthouse was relighted as an aid to navigation on August 27, 1994. Restoration has been ongoing, and most recently, the interior of the building has been renovated and new exhibits have been installed. Both of our guests today have been involved with the Southeast Lighthouse Foundation for many years. Lisa Nolan is the executive director, and Dr. Gerald Abbott is the president. I spoke recently with Lisa Nolan and Jerry Abbott. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking this afternoon with Lisa Nolan, Executive Director of the Southeast Lighthouse Foundation on Block Island, Rhode Island, and Dr. Jerry Abbott, who is president of the foundation. Thank you so much for being with me today, Lisa and Jerry. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm very happy to be here. So Lisa, I've visited with you at the Lighthouse a number of times over the years. It's been a few years now. I need to get back. But uh, let me ask you, when and how did you become the Executive Director of the Southeast Lighthouse Foundation? Um, Well, I had been coming to Block Island Summers for a a number of years, starting in the late 1970s, and um, just fell in love with the island. And when things were heating up with the lighthouse, uh, I had been working with the Historical Society and Jerry Abbott and Pam Littlefield at the time. And uh, I had heard that this position was Uh, coming open. And I thought uh, I would leave the big city. I was working at a museum in New York at the time and uh, thought, well, I'll I'll go back for a a couple of years and see if I can help out the the lighthouse. And then I'll eventually go back to the big city. But that was um, 30 years ago. Never never did go (laughs) Mm -hmm. back. (laughs) Okay. Uh, You live in the modern ranch house next to the lighthouse, right? As opposed to the the older keeper's house, which is attached to the, uh, the tower. So what's it like living at a tourist attraction? <laughs> um, well, it's it's like living in a tourist attraction. <laughs> in the winter, it's actually the we've got beautiful scenic views and pretty much have the place to ourselves. And in the summertime, it can get a little little interesting. You've got people sort of peeking in your window saying, oh, my goodness, someone lives here. Uh, <laughs> So it, it's, um, it's, it can be interesting. We've got lots of little situations going on, but people are generally very nice and excited to be there. Yeah. Well, you must, uh, you must like it overall. You've lived there for, for like 30 years now, right? I do like it well enough. Absolutely. Yes. Well, that's good. So Jerry, uh, you're a doctor at Mass General Hospital. What is your medical specialty exactly? It's a chest radiology. It's a, the field of radiology with a subspecialty in chest disease. And what led you to become involved with the lighthouse? I came to Block Island for the first time in 1980 on a sailboat, and I was just really taken with the island. I'd never seen it before. I was raised in Iowa, of all places. Oh, and we, cool. had, we had no lighthouses, uh, to speak of, perhaps along a river on either border. But I, I was struck by the island's rural quality. It, re, it evoked the landscape I was used to in Iowa, sort of Grant Wood paintings with rolling hills, but these wonderful stone walls. And then the ocean just everywhere. And I bought a place there within six months, an old historic farm, and I got it on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, and that, that brought me to the attention of the local historical society. And they wanted to know how I did that. And I explained and yada, yada, as the saying goes. But interestingly, that first day I was ever on Bach Island, I bicycled to the, around the island. And I came to the Southeast Point and walked uh, to the edge and saw the lighthouse. And I was really stunned by this majestic building, you know, perched on this cliff and I just couldn't believe it. At the same time, I overheard a local woman speaking to one of her guests and she was pointing to the lighthouse and she said, oh, it's going to fall into the sea. And I thought, oh my God, how can that? Anyway, that sort of got piqued my interest. And then through my involvement with the Historical Society, uh, I got interested in the possibility of saving the light. A lot of people, including myself, feel that the Block Island Southeast Lighthouse is a pretty special building. It's really 
uh, striking looking. Sort of a two-part question here. Is it unique among lighthouses and, and what's so special about the architecture? It is unique. It's a Victorian Gothic revival. And you can see that in the steep pitch of the roof, the elongated windows on some parts of the building. There was apparently a, a fairly identical building on, on Lake Michigan, I believe, but that was destroyed, I believe, back in the 50s. Uh, I've seen various writings about lighthouses in general and uh, New England in particular, and the Southeast Light is considered one of the more sophisticated architecturally of all lighthouses, uh, not just by its size, but by that Gothic revival style and the, the incredible interior details, these exposed wooden struts that support the roof structure, for instance. But you could see on our website, by the way, southeastlighthouse.org, mm -hmm. which is a wor worth a trip uh, in yeah. your in your surfing because it's got this whole story and lots of great images. So it's very unique. And we, we, after we moved the building, we did immediately begin the process of having it nominated to be a national historic landmark, which was promptly granted. Yeah, it's one of only about a dozen lighthouses that are national historic landmarks. So it's a pretty special designation. It's certainly right up at the top of my list uh, as a, the, one of the most beautiful lighthouses. The location is pretty spectacular too. So uh, before we talk about more recent history, which I definitely want to do, this is a question for either or both of you. Are there any particular stories of the, the past, the history of the lighthouse, that maybe the stories of the keepers and their families that kind of stand out for you? The one that I've heard uh, relayed most frequently, it was, it was at the time of the 1938 hurricane, which is a very devastating storm along the New England coast. Yeah. And the uh, keeper's wife uh, from that era talked about the men, uh, the tent, the keepers being up in the lantern of the light. Uh, I think some of the glass had blown out and probably part of the roof. And they, they had metal dishpans over their, over their heads to keep from being struck by large sized rocks were actually blowing up the bluff Oof. because of the, yeah, which is amazing to think about. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and the keeper's wife, she, she makes a, joke upon herself because at the same time she was downstairs very nervously making soup for these men up and she kept adding wow. salt and adding salt and adding <laughs> salt and she said it was the saltiest soup she ever made and she blamed that on this on the stress of that great great moment but other stories i've seen a wonderful photograph inscribed in the back where a woman from new york and she gives her address in one of those lower east side tenements of the time and she is thanking profusely thanking the lighthouse keeper and, and his uh, staff for saving her husband's life. Because there mm -hmm. were many, many shipwrecks around Block Island and uh, the lighthouse obviously played a very important point in avoiding shipwrecks, but not all of them could be prevented. So. Right, I know there were some major shipwrecks in uh, Block Island Sound in that area. And just for people listening who might not know about it, the hurricane of 1938 that you referred to, September 1938, killed around 700 people in New England, mostly on the South Coast, mostly mostly Rhode Island. And uh, seven people actually died at lighthouses on the South Coast of New England in that storm. Yeah. Five of them at Prudence Island in Rhode Island when the keeper's yeah. house was, was swept away. So being in such an exposed high location there yes. uh, on the Mohegan Bluffs of Block Island, that must have been absolutely uh, yes. terrifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's another interesting story about the hurricane that uh, I believe Edie Blaine tells that a young block on a woman was a, on the mainland attending college and she heard a, a scratchy radio broadcast right after the hurricane and they reported that Block Island was missing. Mm. It was no longer visible, which of ah. course was not, was not true. Yeah. But she, she was uh, very upset because she thought her whole family had been wiped away. So Wow. There's a lot of chaos and a lot of high water and destruction in the air. So Yeah. I know, obviously, the lighthouse is a pretty big uh, tourist attraction now. Block Island gets a, a lot of visitors uh, in summer. But was it a tourist attraction from the start, right from the time it was built? Oh, yes. Uh, you can read contemporary newspaper accounts that describe it in various uh, laudatory phrases. One uh, writer calls it a, a wonder of our coast, a wonder of our coast. They talk about walking up the staircase to the lantern with the, this barrel of prisms, because you know, the, the lens is 12 or 11 feet tall. I mean, six people could stand inside the first order lens. It's such a, people yeah. are amazed how big the lens is. So yes, it was quite an attraction. People would come and have sit and you know, gaze at the lighthouse and the bluffs and the, the view to uh, infinity across the ocean. 
looking towards Europe. And to see that light at night must have been kind of miraculous too, then incredibly oh, yeah. bright yeah. light. Yeah. Some of the Is islanders it, say they've never lived without the uh, Edie Blaine's. It's one of our local landmarks, Edith Littlefield Blaine. She's so she's never lived without the green light of the southeast light blinking in her bedroom. So wow, a constant friend. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it has a comforting quality to it. I'm sure, Jerry, you've been involved with the uh, Southeast Lighthouse Foundation since the time it started. And yes. uh, you mentioned, well, you mentioned that uh, people were saying, well, the lighthouse is going to fall over the cliff. And I understand also the Coast Guard was, because of that danger, the Coast Guard was considering demolishing the lighthouse. Correct me if that's, if that's wrong, but uh, can you tell me how uh, you prevented that from happening? And that kind of leads to the, uh, the move of the lighthouse that you were very involved in, too. That we did learn several years into this that the Coast Guard did, in fact, have a line item in their budget for $100,000 to demolish the lighthouse. But that didn't really come to the surface until later. And at, at that, by that point, the Coast Guard was already in very, very cooperative and supportive of our idea. We, in 1983, I wrote the first letter to the Coast Guard Admiral on behalf of the Block Island Historical Society. And we had some outstanding people on that board, a woman who was descended from the lighthouse keepers. We had a merchant marine captain who had, who had guided convoys across in World War II. We had a, another uh, retired merchant marine captain. We had a retired Coast Guard uh, captain. So I, I gathered them together as a group and we made an appointment to visit the Admiral in Boston at, at the uh, First District Command. And that entourage really impressed the uh, Admiral. They, they just represented the great tradition and spirit of the island and the whole lighthouse culture. And I, I did most of the talk and I was a young doctor from New York then and I had done a lot of research about this and I, th I thought I knew we, how we could get their cooperation and we could make this happen. And the Admiral was so impressed by these people from Block Island and the, I think he really likes lighthouses too, or did. He's passed on now. Admiral Rebecca, a very helpful yeah. person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice man. So that started the ball rolling. And then we, we enlisted the cooperation of our State Historic Preservation Commission, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, many, many, many local citizens. Uh, Lisa mentioned before, and I want to be sure I mentioned Pam Littlefield, a young woman, a contemporary of Lisa's. And she has been with this since day one also. She's now, her last name is now Pam Gasner. And she's the executive director of the Block Island Historical Society, from whence this whole effort began in 83. And then three years later, Jeremy, the, we, the Historical Society board thought they should form a separate entity to guide this project just because of the possibility of great financial liabilities. And that's when the Southeast Lighthouse Foundation was formed. Jerry, you and Pam, who you just mentioned, and Lisa, you've all been involved for for 30 to 40-ish to years yes, uh, with that, that lighthouse. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And some, some days we feel it, but not usually. <laughs> yeah, which is, you I know, think, I... probably longer than any keeper ever lived there, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. By, yeah. Probably by far, yeah. So I always I always say, too, that it took 10 years to, that it was a 10-year campaign to move the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. It took 10, 10 years, three acts of Congress, and $2 million dollars. And then it took, uh, what, five, five months to five prepare? Five months, Five yeah. months to prepare the building for the move. Two and, and a half weeks to travel on all three legs, yeah. yeah it was done as a zigzag on track. So and Lisa was right there and Pam was right there. It was a, and Jerry was right there. <laughs> very exciting. Yeah. Well, let's talk a bit more about the move. First of all, how desperate was the situation? At that point, when we began the effort, the distance between the light tower and the edge of the bluff was about 55 feet and we were told by the engineers and movers that if it got to 40 feet, no one would touch it because they'd be afraid to bring their heavy equipment out uh, on the per, you know, peripheral to the building itself near right. the end. So it was, and we, we did bring attention to that. Uh, very fortunate for us, a sailor who had a, a big Sikorsky helicopter, the block out of race week. Uh, I, I said, let's go get that guy to loan us his helicopter. And I took a young friend of mine, Judy Watts, who was photographing all the historic buildings on the island and quite an attractive person in many ways. And I said, Judy, let's go talk to this guy. And he was, I, I don't know if I should say his name or not, but he was very generously gave us his two pilots and the Sikorsky helicopter for two hours. So we were able to hover right over the lighthouse. And if you go again on the website, you'll see that aerial shot. Mm. And that really brought home the point that this is very close to the, to the edge. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the lighthouse now, we, when we did move the building, we left a big boulder right where the tower stood. 
So in the future decades, people can sort of say, oh, that's where it would have been if they hadn't moved it. So I remember when I visited there, like I said, the first time around around 89 or 90, somewhere in there. Yeah, uh, it, it looked uh, kind of uh, scarily <laughs> close to the edge little, at that point. Pre- precarious. Yeah, <laughs> it, it would have been too late now, for yeah. sure. It's, yeah. it's within the 40 feet from yeah. the, from the yeah. rock now. Uh, it was, so it was moved back in 93. It was at that time, it was actually one of the first major moves of a lighthouse in the country, if not the first. It was the, on that scale. Yeah, oh, it was. It was the first large lighthouse to be moved. And it really set the tone. Our, that same team went on to move Cape Hatteras and other lighthouses in New England. So it yeah. did it did start a trend. And, you know, hats off to the engineer and the expert house movers and uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers engineer. and International Chimney. Those three entities worked in great cooperation on the engineering facets of the project. Like you said, they've worked together on a a number of lighthouse moves, most famously probably Cape Hatteras, but uh, it was the tallest, uh, tallest lighthouse in the country. It's amazing what they did there, but there's been a a bunch of other ones, like you said, in New England. So how much did it cost again and how was that funding put together? The move itself was 2.3 when all, all was said and done. We had uh, a, an appropriation from the federal government. That was one of those three acts of Congress. We had monies through grants. We had a lot of private donations, a long list of generous people who supported us. State and of Rhode State Island. State of Rhode Island. Yeah. yeah, and it all came together. That, that once, once people began to think that it could happen, anyone who knew the lighthouse was sort of on board. I mean, like 99.9% of the people were <laughs> for There were a few curmudgeons who thought we shouldn't touch it, you know, but they got muffled into the background because people wanted to see it saved. And thank God it worked, right? I mean, we did hold our breath those first few moments because it could have gone bad, but it didn't. Thank yeah, God. it's incredible because it's all one building, the massive brick towers attached to the massive keeper's quarters. Yeah. And the whole thing was moved together. It wasn't taken apart or anything. Correct. And the, the balance had to be maintained because, uh, you know, they're not equal weight on each side. Right. So it boggles the mind to think what they pulled off there. So you were both present for that that process, for that move. Can you say a little bit more about what that was like uh, from a personal standpoint, uh, seeing that actually happen after such hard work? Well, at least they heard more of it than I. I had to go back to New York and be a doctor. Well, once they once they got the building, they called it cracking the building. Once they got it sort of cracked. That's that, a vertical vertical lift. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was for, from what the contractor said, that was the most uh, dangerous moment, dangerous yeah. moment yeah. For, for them. And then it was set down on a 34 point uh, jacking system on giant, eye beams with rollers and and then they pushed the whole thing back on these travel beams with hydraulic ram jacks and what they did first before they began to push was grease up the the beams with ivory bars of ivory soap and we actually had a, a funny little moment where we had they told us when they were going to to move it and we planned a big celebration we had all the dignitaries there a the big tent we invited the whole community but the day before the contractors understandably wanted to make sure that the the move would go smoothly so they started a test run but it was going so well that by the end of that first day it was almost at the end of the first leg and then we all woke up the next morning and we had the tent there and we were sort of already looking at the the lighthouse <laughs> moved a long way down the track they they left enough room that it was still a big celebration that mm-hmm. that next day but <laughs> it it was it was a little too successful as far as uh as far as the ceremony it, was concerned it made sort of a groaning sound too as it moved just a subtle yeah. groan <laughs> and they would they would line up bars of, of ivory soap along the rails at you know, certain distances. And as the building crept forward, it would knock the bar over and, you know, lubricate some more. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And, and that was considered very fast, but people watching it did need to see a benchmark like the, the bars of soap to see that it actually was, yeah. was moving because it wasn't like driving a car. It was right. it's very it's slow. As- and how long again did it take from start to finish? Once it was up and going, it was two and a half weeks. As you mentioned, the varying weights of the building made it more feasible to move it three on three separate legs. So they drove it down the first leg, then reset the tracks. Right angle. 
and back to a, a brand new foundation. And with all of the resetting, it took two and a half weeks to. Mm -hmm. to and it was moved how many feet? 245 feet as the crow flies, but it traveled 305 uh, right. feet on so the three legs. Like you three said, it zigzagged somewhat. Right. Uh, and how did it feel when it was completed for both of you? A relief. <laughs> relief. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure yeah. everyone felt relief. Yeah. I mean, Evan, we were, Evan was very excited. We yeah. Were very excited. Just because yeah. like, we kept waiting for a crack to appear or something horrible. But nothing did. No, there really weren't yeah. any. Uh, there was one or two hairline cracks in the mortar of one of the areas that was easily pointed. No structural damage at all. And the reason for the zigzag, uh, Jeremy, was to keep the weight symmetric uh, weight load. Whereas mm -hmm. instead of going out a diagonal, it would have been much more complex to balance out the load. And that was a, a wise choice on the engineer's part. They know what they're doing. There's no doubt about that. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, goodness. Yeah. When we speak, people speak of the erosion of the bluff, your listeners might imagine just crumbling edge. But in fact, the, the bluff is part of what's called a terminal moraine in geological terms. It's the, what the receding edge of the glacier left, you know, eons ago, lots of gravel and clay. So what happens, instead of just crumbling at the edge, you get what is called, called slumps. And it might be the size of your kitchen table. It might be, might be an acre. I mean, slumps, they just slide right down the bluff as one. It can change very dramatically after a slump. I know it's maybe pretty hard to say, but is, is there a fear that uh, there's going to be a lot more of that soon? Or what's the outlook for that? Well, the, the calculation is that we're probably safe for a hundred and some years. I'm not quite sure how long. We, there have been other slumps along that whole southern coast. There was a great tragedy. After we moved the lighthouse, there was a slump that actually buried a, a little young boy. Great tragedy. But it, it, it illustrated how dramatic and how sudden these slumps can occur. We are hoping we're okay for another hundred or so years and another generation can take it up and maybe move it again. They can't say it can't be done because it's been done. So we shall see. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, the lens a little bit. The, there was a first order lens in the lighthouse before the move, but there's a different first order lens in there now. Basically, why is there a different lens from uh, before the move? Well, first of all, you, you, you missed one lens. There was a lens in between. Originally, there was a lens virtually identical to the ones there now, made, made in Paris in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. and that was replaced, I'm not sure, was that in the 30s? Or? Uh, 1929. 1929, that was replaced uh, with the center section of a bullseye lens that had eight panels. And that's, what the, that's the light that most Block Islanders know, and it's the first one I saw. It was because it was just rotating on a bed of mercury mm -hmm. and, and radiating these beautiful eight spokes of light at night very beautifully. Yeah. Uh, but then when we were, were going to move the lighthouse and did move it, the Coast Guard, because of, of environmental issues, the, the bed of mercury was a huge uh, problem. And uh, many people were upset about that, but we had no choice but to defer to those uh, important ecological or environmental rules. And the, the Coast Guard said, well, we, we, let's see if we can find you a first order lens. And that's what they did. They found one in this gymnasium in Norfolk, Virginia. And I think the Coast Guard got so enthusiastic about the project because it's such a majestic building. It tells the story of the lighthouse service which became the coast guard they really got got involved and excited about this and found that lens and now there it is and it's uh, people just marvel at it because it's a spectacular device to see not only in its beauty but its science too the way it bends the rays of lights into this powerful horizontal beam based on the fresnel principle as you know lighthouse aficionados are certainly familiar with fresnel lenses yep. but yep. uh we may have some newbies listening well, hopefully, hopefully 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 we do we need hopefully they're Hopefully they're hooked now. Lisa, I think this question would be for you. The lighthouse has been open to the public for many years. It's been a tourist attraction for many years, as we were saying. Around how many visitors do you get there? Well, since the move, we've uh, opened the tower every summer to the public. And mm -hmm. we allow free access to the our, our staff and, and the information point. Um, we have offered guided tours which we do keep track of and that's three to four thousand people a year but i th the uncounted people are in the tens of thousands who who come uh through and it's many tens of thousands visiting the grounds every summer 
sure. I'm sure. I have no doubt about that. So there's been a lot of restoration over the years, a number of projects, uh, largely on the exterior, but the most recent project uh, involves the interior of the building. Last time I was there, there was still quite a bit of work to be done inside the building. So it's pretty exciting to, to see pictures of what's happened there lately. Can you tell, uh, tell us about the work that's happened there lately? Well, a lot of stuff has happened. Uh, the, we had an amazing contractor, uh, Keith Lescarbeau of a company yes. called AppCore. And it's worth mentioning his name because he, uh, on many levels, and he has restored other lighthouses in Rhode Island very yeah. mas masterfully. And he's an incredibly resourceful person, very careful, very much a historic preservationist, but he knows how to extrapolate some elements into the modern world. So for instance, the doors, they look just like our historic interior doors, but in fact, they have a thin cement core that is faced with wood on both sides, with, with the matching trim and so forth. And all the doors, uh, it's got a very sophisticated fire system. The doors are all he held open at with a little sort of doorstop looking apparatus. But if there's a fire, click, 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 doors will close. The whole thing is protected. But meanwhile, he went, went on to preserve all the original woodwork that we had including those dramatic struts, these vertical struts that support the roof structure. And again, I, I would refer your listeners to the website to see the original uh, architectural plans for those struts and a photograph showing them. They're really beautiful. They look, you think you're entering a, an Egyptian tomb or something. They have a very sort of haunting look to them, I think. Hmm. Uh, uh, Lisa, what else could you, we talk about? Well, Jerry's been referring to the restoration in the cottage area, but in 2019, we completed... Um, a prior restoration of the of the tower elements and picking up on the theme of modern technology, uh, Mr. Les Carbo utilized uh, a foundry that integrated 3D printing for fabrication of some of the watch level deck plates that were too large for a traditional foundry. So he's mm. he's very adept at using very modern technology and very old techniques as as that might have been undertaken in the 19th century. He's a wonder. We love him. And we went back to the original drawings. If you look at the outside of the tower, the deck, uh, the light tower, the watchtower rather outside the lantern now is uh, octagonal. And it's ex it exactly what it was originally designed. Back in the 20s or 30s, they replaced it with a circular array, which looked nice enough, but it wasn't authentic. So Keith has done some amazing things to bring things back. You really see the building now the way it was. And Lisa mentioned that cast iron restoration project in the light tower. The, the staircase is a beautiful structure. And when you get up top, there's some more beautiful uh, cast iron work, but it had really deteriorated and needed to be recoded. So they sandblasted, I shouldn't use the word sandblasted, they used a ground walnut ground shells. walnut shells uh, for, instead of sand uh, or whatever. And that would right. still have enough impact to take away the paint, but it would not dent or, or uh, disfigure the underlying cast iron. So mm -hmm. the, the light tower now, it's just spectacular. It's just in just great condition. Lisa mentioned that the printer, 3D printer, those were the, the actual decks. If you went up to the where the, the lens is resting, it's like a big piece, a big pie cut into eight sections of cast mm -hmm. iron. Yeah. Two of those had to be recast and that was mm -hmm. no easy feat. And that's where uh, Keith used the 3D printing through the one foundry, which is actually in New England, was able to, to do the job. So. Wow, that's amazing. Well, you hired uh, the right company, the right guy, because I, I, I know Keith and I know that some of the work he's done at uh, places like Plum Beach Lighthouse, Rhode yeah, Island, and uh, Palm, Palm Rocks on the Providence River uh, and uh, uh, some others. And uh, he, uh, he is one of the best, so. Uh, that's really great to hear. I can't wait to, to get there and see see the work that's been done. Uh, so you have some new exhibits, I believe. Could you say a little bit about uh, what is now there? That what, what do people typically experience when they go there? They experience the, the story of Block Island in a very concise way, the history of lighthouses on Block Island, as well as the history of life-saving stations. The island, Block Island is only three by five miles, but at one point it had two lighthouses, the north at Sandy Point, and the southeast and then around the perimeter there were one two three different life-saving stations and they all worked in a, in a synchrony to avoid shipwrecks and to rescue those who might suffer from a shipwreck so it was quite life-saving was a really a big big deal on block island 
it, it's a great history. They all see exhibits about that. They all see exhibits about Block Island Light. Uh, if you go back before the time of lighthouses, Block Island was originally uh, inhabited by people who were, well, of course, the Native Americans who had quite an interesting archaeology. We've been exp uh, the local historical society has done some great uh, projects on that on that topic. So they so see a bit of archaeology. They'll learn about the uh, European settlers being farmers, and then fishermen, and then uh, the Victorian tourism trade, which started right about the time the Southeast Light was built. Because about that same time, the island had a breakwater constructed by the federal government that really gave the island its first reliable harbor. There was no natural harbor around Block Island. And that's why it was never a big whaling place like Nantucket, for instance. But uh, yeah. so it's a great it's a great history, really, the farming, the fishing, the Victorian tourism, the architecture, the, the life saving. Uh, World War Two, the last U-boat sunk in World War Two is right off Block Island. So right. the island's island seen a lot of history. And we're trying to depict that in, in a fairly concise way. We hope to open up more museum space in the coming years and expand those exhibits. And the credit for a lot of the uh, items on display goes also to the Block Island Historical Society, who has an amazing collection. Mm -hmm. And we're, we have a number of things on loan that Lisa uh, worked out with Pam Gasner to tell the story. And it looks great, I have to say. <laughs> we, we also have a couple of rooms set up as if it's uh, the keeper's quarters, as if they've gotten up for the day and gone gone out to work, which are, which are wonderful. Uh, and the core of, of those rooms were donations from uh, uh, one of the board members, uh, Gene Napier, that, that Jerry mentioned earlier, who was a descendant of Willett Clark Jr., one of the keepers. Um, yeah. She unfortunately has just passed away, but left many of her family's uh, items uh, utilized in the Southeast Light um, and left them for us to, to display. It's a great room on display. You walk through the, a pair of those struts, as I mentioned, and you're in this very this beautiful little garret space. We had Jean's uh, the, this antique bed and some furnishings, and it's just, it, it looks real because it is real. Yeah. It's just great. Yeah. yeah. Well, that sounds like a perfect combination, the historical exhibits and uh, having part of it uh, made to look like it did when, when uh, keepers lived there. That sounds... Sounds perfect to me. Uh, another thing uh, that I've heard uh, over the, the years, and uh, I think I've read somewhere pretty recently, there are, I think, are plans for rental accommodations in the building. Am I right about that? Yes, we, we, we've, uh, we're refining those plans at the moment. At one point, we thought about having two or three units, and then we've settled now on the idea of having one sort of, I don't want to say high end, but a very nice unit, uh, you know, fit, modest, but good quality I'm sure there are some listeners who aren't familiar with Block Island. Can you say a little bit about how people get to the island and what else is there to do on Block Island besides visit the, the two lighthouses there? Um, well, typically you would need to take a, a ferry or a private boat or a plane. There are outlets from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Montauk and Connecticut Things to do other than visiting our, our beautiful lighthouses are we're known for our beaches. We've got many, many greenway paths. We have almost 50% preserved open spaces. There are beautiful scenic views everywhere. Mm -hmm. The harbor, the town has a lot of little boutique places to shop. We like to think it's a fairly low key slow pace. <laughs> laid back. <laughs> laid back. Sometimes in July and August it feels a little more hectic than that but those are the those are the primary attractions i think that people are coming for and it's not a very big island so you can easily get around you can even you can walk you can bike you can a taxi will give you a quick tour if you want it's only three by five miles so and almost anywhere you are you'll you can get an ocean view pretty easily so mm -hmm. you're very aware of the ocean the sea yeah. breeze it's worth it for the sea breezes alone the air is spectacular uh, I agree. It's it's uh, not hard to get around there. And there's also the bike rental place, I think, right near where the ferry comes in, right? Yeah, yes. several, yeah. yeah. Several, okay. It's a little bit hilly, so people uh, going off on a bike should probably be aware of that. <laughs> yeah, but they're soft hills. They're soft rolling. Okay. <laughs> well, that's e easy for you to say. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> yeah. These things, of course, uh, preservation, restoration of lighthouses is never really finished. There's always more that needs to be done. You finish one project and something else needs doing 
immediately, but are, are there any other major projects planned at this time? Well, we've been working on the landscaping. We want to replace the fence along the entrance. Uh, we also have to be very careful about the fencing along the perimeter so no one gets crawls over and gets injured. But as you say, there is ongoing maintenance. Now, Lisa just completed a, a, an application for, uh, you tell them. Uh, well, yeah, the next, the immediate uh, need is for some storm windows for the, the newly restored portion of the cottage. And of course, we are still raising funds to finish the, the other side for m more museum space and the, the rental. Um, some outdoor lighting would be great. And then I think after all of those things, we probably need to start over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a boat, really. A, a building on Block Island is like a boat. And this is a big boat with a lot of cast iron. Yeah. And uh, it's probably never going to end. But boy, it sure looks great now, I must yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. It's just such a great lighthouse. And I, I can't tell you how much I, I want to get back. It's been, I think it's been five or six years since I was on the island. It's hard to believe that much time has passed. But I'm aiming for next year. I don't think it's going to happen this year. But I have uh, two final questions for both of you. And these are for, for bonus points or extra credit. So uh, <laughs> get, get ready here. So uh, first of all, for both of you, what is special about Block Island Southeast Lighthouse? Well, it's an architectural marble. I mean, I've, I've restored several houses in my career and got them on the National Register. And I'm very, I'm very, I've seen a lot of historic architecture really around the world, but it's just, it's world-class, the architecture. And then you place it on this high bluff looking out to sea, and it's a beautiful bluff, and the island's beautiful. It's got incredible green and lots of preserved land, as Lisa pointed out. And uh, it's just very unique. There you are, the, the sea breeze coming in, the beautiful sea in front of you and in storms it's very dramatic I, I love to be there when it's uh, stormy because you see how valuable the light is the light itself is uh, saved so many lives really there's no question it saved lives and now of course people have satellites and et cetera, et cetera. but uh, a lot of the old timers will still tell you they, they like they still like to use a lighthouse lisa you want to add anything about what's uh, what's special about the lighthouse well, I've really enjoyed getting to know and work with all of the dedicated people over the years. I'm Jerry is one of my best friends, and I I've enjoyed working with him and and the other board members. And the Southeast Lighthouse is the reason that I'm that I've met them all and and spent a lot of my life with. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I imagine it brought a lot of people together over the years it's been in existence. I'm sure the keepers and because visitors were always coming. I think it's always caused us a, caused a certain bond between people who were familiar with it, whether they lived there or just visited. Especially yeah. if they lived there, they must have had some incredible memories and loyalties. And people come back and they'll say, "Oh, my grandfather or my grandmother, blah blah blah." And it's it's left a, an indelible bond with them too, which is nice to know. And that reminds me, you have a lot of weddings there, right? The last few years, not as much because of the, the restoration work. But yes, yeah. typically we, we do have quite a few couples um, celebrate their, their vows. Yeah. So I have one, one more question. And Lisa, to at least some extent, you probably already answered this, but you can add something more if you want to. And Jerry also. I was going to ask you, what have you enjoyed most about your association with the Lighthouse and the Southeast Lighthouse Foundation? Yeah, I feel like my last answer probably covers this one pretty pretty yeah. well. I think I think I would agree. The camaraderie, the friendship, the the challenges, and then the successes, which were sometimes slow to come, but all the, all the sweeter for the fact that you had been wishing for them for so long. And it's just nice to be part of this. It's such a great building. It portrays a great spirit of our nation. The, the life saving, the protecting people, saving people, and uh, it's just a very proud, uh, proud monument to, I think, the better things that humans can do in this world. So. Well that sums, said. Yes, sums it up very nicely. Well, I'm, we could talk a lot more. There's a lot to talk about with that lighthouse. And it, it absolutely is one of my favorites. It's right up at the top of my list. And since I started this podcast, I wanted to, to feature <clears> it. So I'm glad uh, we were able to sit down today and, and talk. Before we wrap things up here, Jerry, do you want to tell people again about the website for the organization? Yes, the website has just been updated, by the way, and it's we're very proud of it. It's www.southeastlighthouse.org. 
it's got a wonderful gallery of photographs, including recent photographs showing the new exhibits and a lot of history. And it is an embedded video showing the move. Your visitors could actually see the engineering aspects of the move. It's, we're very happy with the website. Please, we, on behalf of the board of directors, uh, Lisa and I invite all your listeners to come visit the lighthouse. Yeah, oh, it's a beautiful website. I was just looking at it and uh, it was so nice seeing the, the work that's been completed lately. So again, uh, Lisa and Jerry, I want to thank you so much for spending time with me today. This was great. And uh, I'm going to see you there. I hope next year, maybe uh, if you'll allow me to shoot a little video, maybe for the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So can't, can't wait to get there. Thank you so much, Lisa and Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure. To learn more about the Block Island Southeast Lighthouse Foundation, visit southeastlighthouse.org. I wrote a book on Rhode Island lighthouses a number of years ago with a chapter on Block Island Southeast Light. You can get that book from Amazon and other online booksellers. The book is called The Lighthouses of Rhode Island. I think that's pretty clever, don't you think? <laughs> Uh, anyway, it was a pleasure speaking with Lisa and Jerry for the podcast, and I hope to get back out there soon. Uh, I'm really hoping uh, to get there next year to see their recent restoration work. Thanks, as always, to all the staff, members, and volunteers of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Visit uslhs.org to learn about tours and all the other things the Society offers. Memberships and donations support lighthouse preservation and education projects, including this podcast. Thanks to everyone who works to preserve lighthouses and their history. Keep up the good work. We're all on the same team. The Persian poet Rumi once wrote, quote, On a day when the wind is perfect, the sail just needs to open and the world is full of beauty, end quote. Next week's guest will be Josh Liller, Florida Lighthouse historian and author of the new second edition of the book, The Florida Lighthouse Trail. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light.